Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, the producer of the show. We're certainly happy to have you here with us today. Hey, don't forget to check out that drink, Aura Bora, right? Uh, we talked about that with Paul and Maddie Vogie uh, two episodes ago. It's so good, y'all. And uh, I don't get paid a dime to say that. I just love the drink. Um, we've got a great guest today, a bit of a newcomer to the Enneagram. Uh, she is an Enneagram 3, Jordan Lee Dooley. She is a national best-selling author, speaker, founder, and CEO of Own It Academy, and of course, the host of She, a top-rated podcast for women. Listen, you don't always get this, but she goes midway through this interview. She goes really uh, to the heart of one of her most challenging um experiences in life and gets really vulnerable and we really appreciate that uh it's a real treat as a three for her to go there and um anyway she was a delight to have on the show and uh we're certainly happy to have you here um today as well glad you're with us and that's it for me anthony skinner without any further ado let's get to the host of our show ian cron Jordan Lee Dooley, welcome to Typology. Thank you. It's so fun to be here. Excited to chat. Yeah, me too. I've been looking forward to our conversation. You are an Enneagram 3, the performer, and I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what your history is with the Enneagram. It's minor. I, I'm a kind of person who, if someone tells me you are this or you are that, it makes me feel like I'm in a box. And so I don't like it. And so I've always been skeptical of anything that feels like a personality test, but I've uh, read a little bit about it and just learned from some friends more. They pretty much just have like coached me through it in conversation. But honestly, I feel like I'm a toddler at this. So I'm excited to get to chat and learn more from you too. Great. And so what book did you read about it? I read The Road Back to You. Oh, you did? <laughs> yes. Oh. Well, we're already friends. Great. Okay. We're already friends from one author to another. We're already friends. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> um, so tell me, how did you feel when you read the description of the Enneagram 3 in the book? Um, so that's a good question. I think I felt seen and I also felt weird because... I, it's never fun. I, I've talked to several different friends about this and they say women, especially Christian women, sometimes feel a little uncomfortable when something kind of straight up lays out like, hey, you're an achiever and you can be a performer. It doesn't sound very nice. Like it doesn't sound very warm and fuzzy. And at first I was like, ooh, I should probably feel bad about that. But then after five seconds, I was like, nah, it's accurate. <laughs> well, you know, um, I think that in the beginning, the um, because the Enneagram reveals what's that what's best about you is what's worst about you. And that's what what's worst about you is also what's best about you. Yes, right? that's what I felt. I was like, this is crazy. It's like my strength can also be my downfall in the oh, same way. Totally. Yeah. It totally can be. And so what happens is in the beginning of your journey with the Enneagram, and I get this a lot at workshops, right? People are like, I don't know this sounds so negative, hmm. right? And I'm like, because it reveals sort of the shadow aspect of your personality. And before you can get to the bright stuff, you kind of have to move through the shadow stuff. Right, right, right. So, yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so I've had people cry at workshops. I, I sometimes I laugh and I go, I can make you cry because, <laughs> because literally sometimes, you know, it, it really hits a nerve with people, but it's also revelatory for them. You know, like they go, now this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now I understand. Right. Yeah. So do you know what your wing is? You're a three. I have no idea. I've never really understood the whole wing thing at all. So I need to be diagnosed is what I've decided. <laughs> awesome. Let's do that. Okay. Excellent. I like that I have a beginner on because that gives me opportunity to kind of like broadcast. Yeah, some, I love this. Yeah, broadcast out to people who are also trying to figure For our out. listeners, because we have so many that are trying to figure out who they are. Totally. We get that a lot. So. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Let me explain it to you real fast. Your wing is one of the two numbers that are adjacent to your main type. So you're a three, right? Okay. That means you could have a four wing or you okay. could have a two wing. 
Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. And how the three with a two wing shows up in the world is very different from how a three with a four wing shows up in the world. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, your wing um, seasons your main wing. So let's say you're a three with a two wing. That means you're you're a three. You will always be a three. It is it is like the it's your dominant type. But if you have a two wing, you begin to pick up some of the characteristic features of that number, right? Some of the strengths and, and maybe even a few of the weaknesses of that type, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So and you can you you really have a dominant wing, but that doesn't mean your other wing doesn't affect you. Right. I oftentimes tell people that, you know, uh, if you see a bird with one wing, it just flies in circles. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have two wings. It's just that one is dominant. Okay. Okay. So I'll describe threes with twos and I'll describe threes with fours. And and you tell me which one sounds more like you. Okay. 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 So first of all, the three, they have an unconscious motivation that kind of drives their behaviors. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's unconscious. It's not like you know it until you start doing some work with the Enneagram. Okay. So for a three, it's a need to succeed, mm-hmm. a need to appear successful, mm-hmm. and to avoid failure at all costs. Mm-hmm. So let's start there. Does that sound like you? Yeah, but I also feel like I've gotten comfortable. Okay. So here's a question. If I've gotten is, the, is it possible if that's kind of my natural state, but is it possible through growth and experience that failure slowly becomes more comfortable to you? Like, I don't, I don't aim, like, I'm very much like, let's make sure we're poking holes in things to avoid failure at all costs. And I take failure like in a way that is not fun. Like I, I struggle with it at first, but I've also kind of come to realize the beauty of it as well. And so there's this, I feel like my brain sometimes wrestles with itself. So I think so. As long as okay. I mean, I guess I look at it like I think I've grown through that a lot because I'm not as terrified of it. I just don't enjoy it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, don't yeah, know what yeah. I don't get a big thrill out of it either. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and I have to face it several times a day. <laughs> um, so, all right. So, what were you? Was that more true of you at 21? Probably yes. Okay. Right. And so, I oftentimes tell people think back to when you were 21 when you had very little self awareness. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this stuff was just operating right underneath the surface. And you didn't know this motivation was driving, driving, driving the way that you act, think, and feel. But with experience, perhaps some of the featured traits of the three begin to soften a little bit. Yes, mm-hmm. that's exactly it. That's great. Perfect. Okay. That, yeah. All right. <laughs> so a three with a two wing, right, mm-hmm. um, is a little more extroverted than a three with a four wing, Right maybe measurably uh, more extroverted. They really seek out opportunities to shine in the world. Okay. Uh, they don't often volunteer personal information or feelings. They can, they can often be personable, but not personal. Okay. okay. And they do care about what others think about them mm-hmm. more than the three with a four wing. Okay. Okay. So now I'll just, just quickly describe it. These are very quick descriptions. It could be quite a bit longer. You know, sure. um, okay. if, uh, you know, we were to go into it that way. So compared to a three with a two, a three with a four wing is more introverted. They're less concerned about what others think of them. And they're, they're more self-reflective. They're more in touch with their feelings. Um, they're more subdued. They uh, require more time for reflection, like being alone and, and reflecting. They, they feel that their value comes uh, from true achievement than appearance, right? Mm-hmm. Which is not like a three with a two wing. And it's a very complicated combination because... The three has a tendency at times to have this chameleon-like ability to change their presentation, right? Swapping masks in order to win the admiration of the group or of others, right? So they can be really great at work in a room, right? They can go from talking to this person and actually kind of mirroring what they feel that person wants from them Mm -hmm. in terms of their identity, their, their presentation. So... The four, on the other hand, is really concerned with authenticity. Mm-hmm. So when your four wing observes your three core type, right, playing the mask changing game, right, mm-hmm. it kind of 
goes like this at it, right? It kind of goes. So for example, I'm a four with a three wing. And I oftentimes tell people when I walk off a stage from speaking somewhere, oftentimes the, my little three wing, my four, my four core type will look at the three and go, oh, you're so full of it. You just weren't all that authentic out there. You did your schmoots, you know, you were like up there doing your thing, man. <laughs> and then my three is looking at my four saying, yeah, but this is how we make a living. You know what right. I mean? Right. So tell me three with two, three with four, which one sounds more like you? My gut says the four, even though I definitely, like when you said the, the two really seeks out opportunities and whatnot, I definitely seek out opportunities, but tell me if this helps affirm what I'm thinking with the four. Mm -hmm. I am such a homebody. And I hate having appointments. Like I would rather like sit in my office and create things all day that I can put out into the world that will make me successful rather than feeling like I actually, I speak quite a bit as well. And I, I like it, but it's not my favorite thing that I do. I like to go into my hole and be creative and then like emerge and then make dinner and like be home. And so I prefer, I, I get my, I get re-energized by being alone. Even at Thanksgiving dinner after four hours of family time, sometimes I just have to go hide out downstairs and come back after 30 minutes. Cause I'm just, I need right. to kind of reset. So that sounds to me a little bit more like the four. Um, and especially the piece about authenticity. Mm -hmm. I agree. Like, that's why I always struggle with, am I really a three? Because there's this huge part of me that's like, don't ever project something that isn't authentic yet. There's this piece of me. that's like, but I understand I've got to work a room and I'm a relationship builder. So I think that combination sounds way more aligned than what you were describing with the two. Right. Okay, good. Okay, check. Whoa, I feel like a woman. <laughs> yeah, we just checked. Checked it off. Now, you know, if you um, get a chance and you have a desire to know more about the Enneagram, there's a lot more. I just did a very basic description. There's a whole lot more to know about wings, right? Okay. In terms of the description of them and stuff. So uh, we're going to talk about your book. We're going to get to that. But, but first, I'm going to play my therapist role, okay, right? Great. Because I'm a, uh, that's what. I kind of do. <laughs> Tell me about your childhood. Oh, that's a good question. Well, what do you want to know? Like my entire childhood or just what my living environment was like? What do you yeah. mean? Okay. You know, just a, you can give me a thumbnail sketch and maybe talk a little bit about relationship with parents and siblings, you know, um, if there was any sort of trauma there that you're, you're willing to talk about. Yeah. Um, I'm real fascinated about that stuff and okay. personality. Well, I think this will make, help make maybe some of the me makes sense. So I was raised, um, I was the oldest child. Mm -hmm. I always say that I have oldest child syndrome because I always have to do things right. Um, and I have a younger brother. And so I grew up, we're about three years apart, grew up with him. And then my parents were married and both my parents were entrepreneurs. And so I learned a lot about, and they were, you know, they were always teaching us about investments and different, you know, ways to be creative financially and the three ways to create wealth. And so I felt like I learned a lot about that as a child and it really mm -hmm. kind of drove my entrepreneurial creative spirit. Um, and my mom stayed home with us. My dad traveled quite a bit. He owned a uh, commercial construction company. And so he would go on job sites quite often. And um, I grew up playing sports. I was very competitive. I would foul out of every basketball game that I ever played, it seemed like. And it was interesting because I was on offense. I was the three point shooter and I would, you know, rack up the points. But on defense, even though I'm short, I would have to play like defense on the posts who were towering over me because I was so aggressive. I would you know, box them out and take them out at the knees and get the rebound. So they called me armadillo. I don't know why. That's what my high school coach called. <laughs> <laughs> a very, uh, complimentary thing to call a young girl, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> that left armadillo. A, that, that, that left a bruise. <laughs> yeah, it did. It totally affected my adulthood. Um, no, but yeah, so that was kind of a joke, but my, just because I was competitive like that. And um, yeah, grew up doing that and, uh, you know, would work inside my parents' small businesses. At one point they had a gumball machine business on the side with a bunch of friends of theirs. So wow. my like, first job was going with my mom and servicing the gumball machines at Great Clips and places like that. Um, I was very much a straight A type student, um, competitive on this, you know, whatever sport I was playing. So I didn't like to do sports that I would fail at. So that's where that comes in. Okay. That's really um, big. Oh, there you go. That's yeah. really big. That yeah. is very three. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were an eight challenger, that wouldn't be the case. Okay. Um, but as a three, because threes are more concerned about their appearance, uh -huh. right? It's yeah. hard for them to do stuff where there's a high possibility of uh, public embarrassment or yeah. the appearance of incompetency at whatever they're doing in the public sphere. 
Yeah. Well, there you go. Because I ran track for one year and I said, if they make me run the 400, partly because I hated it, who wants to sprint for that long? But I said, if I have to run the 400, I'm not going to do this. And first day of practice, I'm sprinting down the track and they said, you have a 400 stride and you're starting in the race on Saturday. And at that point I couldn't say no because they had just like called me up to bat. And so I said, yes. And I tried to lean, I was neck and neck for first place with like the top school in the area. And I tried to lean over the finish line. Like I saw on TV and leaned way too early and face planted on the track. And oh. it, was, it was the worst day of my life. Honestly, it was one of the worst days of my life. Um, so that was pretty much my track career. Um, so yeah, ran, did, did a lot of high school sports, got scholarships to college, got most of my college paid for, um, started a business while I was in college. So that's kind of the synopsis. Um, I was raised Catholic and we, you know, have a big family and a lot of my dad's side of the family would get together for Christmases and holidays and stuff. So yeah. Um, I don't know what else you want to know, but that's kind of a quick nutshell of what it was like. (laughs) Right. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty Mm three-ish, you know, it, it sort of falls in that sort of three sort of feeling zone. And and what was your relationship with your parents like? Really good overall. Um, one thing that I think I noticed later in adulthood that came out and they, they were teaching me the importance of your reputation. Like you can make more money back if you lose money and things like that. But they always emphasize like it's harder to fix your reputation as it like or to heal your reputation as it than it is to, um, you know, if you lose money on a deal or something. So we always talked about that. And it was a really good principle. And I think they taught me that really well. My parents were big hosts. They would often host, you know, gatherings and holidays. And when we had the ability to, instead of putting, you know, extra bonus money into extra, you know, things, they often put it into experiences. So we traveled a lot as a family. I went to Italy and different places around the world um, as a child and as a teenager. And so anyways, but the reputation thing, I think especially as a three, like my brother didn't affect him at all. I think for me, I was like, oh my gosh, my reputation matters more than anything. And I think I really internalized that, although it was Mm. a really great principle. So, but overall, I mean, I have a great relationship with my parents to this day. We actually are living in their basement right now because (laughs) (laughs) you've got that great white background there, which tells me, I was wondering if maybe you were in a prison in North Korea, but now it all makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So yeah, we have, we are building a new house right now. So we, they took us in for about a month and a half, which is really nice. So, but we have a great relationship with them overall. Um, I've never really had a whole lot of, I mean, as any family does, there's always now and then conflict, but it's never anything that's lasted. Right. We're very, we play a lot of games and have a lot of fun and laugh a lot as a family is kind of how I've always seen it. And my mom and I have a very open relationship. Um, my mom's very deep and she's a deep thinker. Like I am, I think I've diagnosed her as a two based off my little knowledge of the Enneagram, but mm-hmm. she and I, like, she's probably the only, I mean, she knows things that most people's moms, I feel like shouldn't probably know about their lives. Like I just talk about every, everything and anything to her. So we have a really good relationship there. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that was really grounded in childhood, but my mom was raised by, my grandmother was from Mexico. So because my grandmother was from Mexico, the Latin culture is very close. Mother, daughter is usually very close a lot of times. And so my mom was one of four boys, the youngest, and my grandmother lost her, her husband when my mom was only two years old. So she and my mom became very, very close because her older brothers went off and moved and she stayed local. And so they had a really tight knit relationship. And so my mom and I have in many ways followed suit, but we are very different personality wise. And so we've had to have conversations about like, okay, this is how you and Nana's relationship was, but this is, it's going to look different from our relationship because we're different than you guys were. So we've had to have conversations about expectations and what that looks like. But I would say overall, we have a very healthy communication and relationship. And I'm, I think that was really rooted in childhood and spending a lot of time together. So your mom, if she is a two, is a big time feeler. Yes. And um, probably um, her feelings can be overwhelming at times Mm -hmm. because it's just feeling, feeling, feeling. It's the most interpersonal number on the Enneagram. They're huggers usually, you know what I mean? Or oftentimes it just sort of depends on what subtype of two. Um, They are uh, um, very affectionate, Mm -hmm. tactile. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, uh, you know, people who love to meet the needs of other people. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes, oh, they go overboard meeting right. the needs of right. other people, right? And feel underappreciated, right? Oh, yeah. And when that happens, mm-hmm. you, you, they'll, at their worst, they'll go into this kind of martyr space where it's like, I do everything for all these people and 
when I have needs, they don't, they don't come to my aid. Mm -hmm. You you know what I mean? So they can get resentful at their worst that other people aren't able to psychically determine what they need and meet those needs. You know, it's like, you're always having to tell it too. How do I know what you need if you don't tell me? Right. And the two doesn't understand that because they actually can psychically figure out what everyone else needs right. and take care of them. Or, Does that- they, or they, they think to ask, this is something I've noticed, not only like with multiple relationships that I, I'm in that I think are either twos or they've told me they're twos, where they think to, they think to ask because that's like part, they identify, oh, they need to be asked what they need, or I can identify what they need. So right. then I think what can happen is they say, well, why don't you ask me what I need? And it's like, well, I don't, my brain doesn't automatically go to that. It's not that I don't care. It's just not my first thought right. where that personality type is often when asking, what do you need? How can I help? What can I do? And they want to be asked that same, they want to be reciprocated in the same right. way. Well, and, and for some threes, when people have needs around them, they get impatient mm-hmm. because they're like, I have stuff to do. Mm-hmm. Like I'm really, really, look at you, you're laughing. Mm-hmm. You, I'm really busy and I'd prefer it if you left your personal life at home. You know what I mean? It's like, I, like, because your needs and all these feelings you're having are slowing me down. Mm-hmm. And I have a list of to-dos that have to get done today. Mm-hmm. And so let's put off this conversation until later when I have more space. And unfortunately, a not very self-aware three will never get around to circling back because the moment they have free time, they automatically put another project in front of themselves because empty space here where the project lives Mm -hmm. is a little, it's unsettling to the three. Yeah. Yep. Does that sound? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> you look like you're being pinned against the wall right now. You're, you've got a smile. Like I thought we were going to talk about my book on this podcast. Oh, I'm, here. I'm here to understand myself and I'm here for help. No. <laughs> okay. So tell me about a time in your life when you failed and how you rebounded. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, there's a lot of examples. Um, Give me I the big say- one. Give okay. me, or actually, oh, even give me a big one you've one. never shared. <laughs> I have, I have a good one. I tell this story all the time, but it's a good one. So one of my most embarrassed, I, I hated, I hated the idea of public speaking because I hate the idea of embarrassment. I've gotten used to embarrassing myself now, so it's a little bit better. But um, when I first started, it was my probably fourth or fifth speaking event that I'd ever done. I had done some like church basements, and I spoke to nine people, and it was really fancy. And then <laughs> somehow, I don't know if it's because you know, I basement is a big theme for you today because. You- <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just saying you've done a lot of appearances in basements and that yeah, kind of freaks me out a little really bit. Bad. Another episode. <laughs> sounds really bad. My alter ego. No. Um, but we, so I, d- I did a bunch of like little small events, but I hadn't really done a whole lot of, you know, speaking to bigger crowds. And one of the first times I got asked to speak to a bigger crowd was um, in Oklahoma and I was the keynote speaker. And for whatever reason, Bethel Music, which is a pretty big um, mm-hmm. band, was the music for the night. Anyways, so I did my talk. The the order of events was Jordan, do your talk. The band's going to come out. They're going to do a six song set. And then you're going to come back out and do like a five to 10 minute wrap up encouragement, send off kind of thing. Easy enough. So I get through the initial talk with no real issues. Then the band comes out, they do their set. And I don't know if you're familiar with Bethel music, but their songs are like 74 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> hold on a second. Hold on a second. Just hold one second. <laughs> Anthony is a songwriter. And Anthony, yeah. have you written songs for Bethel? Yes. <laughs> Well, he's the one to blame then. He, he he's in the room right now. Do, can you please apologize? Oh. To Jordan? I'm so sorry the night went that way. They're beautiful songs. They are just long. Oh, she's backpedaling. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear the clicking of the chain on the gears? <laughs> she's, I'm, not rep- I'm not responsible for repeat, repeat, repeat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you just threw Bethel under the bus. You will never write for them again. Okay, back to you, Jordan. Sorry, that was a little break so I could make fun of my producer. No, that's okay. So because their so- the songs tend to go longer, it had been about an hour or so. I had been in the back room eating snacks because prior- <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, it's probably been about six songs by now. I should probably go back out to stage left to prepare to walk out back onto the stage. So I walk out, I get my mics, my headset on, 
And I'm standing off to the side of the stage. I wish I was in person so I could act this out. But basically, the only person I could see in front of me was the drummer because he was further back. Okay. And he's looking at me. If you're standing where I'm standing, he's, you know, if the stage is this way, he's drumming. And then he looks my way and everything starts to slow down. The music begins to slow down. It looks like it's, it's kind of an outro. And I forget that drummers move their head. So he's doing this. And then he looks at me. And <laughs> he's and I nodding at you. I think it's my cue. Like, come on. So I <laughs> march on out there. Oh, no. <laughs> and I stand center stage thinking they're just like, you know, finishing the, the musical intro for me. And they're still on the first song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were on their fifth song. <laughs> so DeMarco is standing there and I start talking. The guy shut my mic off because then I look at Christine and she looks at me and I just curtsied and walked off stage and stood oh. back there. And I was like, I want to crawl in a hole and eat trail mix for the rest of my life. I'll just go live in a cave. Like I wanted to just disappear. So I, you know, they're, they go into their sixth song and I'm laughing and confused and like nervous sweating. And my husband who wasn't paying attention, he was back eating snacks as well, walks up. He's like, why aren't you out there? What's going on? And I, he looks at my face. He's like, what's wrong? So I realized I have to still go back out there and, you know, wrap up the night. And it was the most awkward thing ever, but I managed to handle it. So I think I just kind of, I went into like, let's make this kind of funny and light and curtsied and then came back off, cracked a joke about it and moved on. Even though inside I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never doing this again. And um, anyways, it was just funny. Cause at the end of the night, this mom and daughter was there. It was like a 15 year old girl and she comes up to me. And at the end of the moment, I hated that she said this, but now I'm like, that was actually a good lesson. She comes up to me and she goes, thank you for being awkward. <laughs> No way. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. So, you know, it reminded me it's good to be human. But in the moment, I just, I don't know. I think in some ways it removed my fear of speaking, but how I handled it and rebounded from it, you know, right off the bat was, all right, make this lighthearted and make it look cool. It's kind of how I had to handle it. So, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, great story. And, um, but I'm going to press in a little bit. Okay. Because it's an entertaining, fun story. Yep. But I'd like to know about a failure that was sort of heartbreaking and how you rebounded. Oh, okay. This isn't, this is, you're getting here. You're getting deep here. I'm going to try not to cry, but um, I would say it's hard to call this a failure because I think any good therapist would say like, this isn't your fault. It's not a failure. That's your fault. But I lost two pregnancies this last year. So this is like way mm. other end of the spectrum. Um, and that has been a really, I mean, I don't think I've rebounded. Honestly, I think I'm mm. in rebound mode. Like I'm seeking out therapy and trying to, but it's a really hard complex thing for me to wrap my head around because I've started to realize pregnancy and like carrying a pregnancy is not something I can just achieve like anything else. Like I had the plan of like in between book one and two, we'll have one baby after book two, we'll have baby. Like now that's all jacked up. And this year just kind of went to hell in a handbasket, honestly, it felt like. And so um, I, you know, have really wrestled with that because it's been something that feels it, it's, a, it makes me feel like I'm so out of control. And so how I've responded was first total panic mode. Um, I, I felt like I self-destructed a little bit. Like I went into a very dark place, did not have any, like, and it was weird. I didn't have motivation for the first time. Granted, there's an element of grief and heartbreak and other things, but then I really wrestled with this, like, what's wrong with my body? Ever since I was 10 years old, I've worked out. I've checked all the boxes. You know, I'm, I've been married a few years. Like I tried to do everything in the right order. Right. And tried to, and I'm like, why did I do that? It just, mm. you know, really isn't working. And people who don't try to be as disciplined as I've been up until this point in my life are carrying babies just fine. So what's wrong with me? So there's been this complex wrestling of almost a sense of why is my body failing? Like, sure. I didn't cognitively do anything wrong, but there's still that element of, I feel like the black sheep of my friend group because they all have 104 children and no problem and, you know, have home births and that's it. And I'm like over here getting tested, trying to figure out what's going on with me. So that would be a deeper area that has really, um, you know, I can cognitively talk about it, no problem. But then I also, when I start reliving the traumas of surgeries I've had to go through and other things that like really breaks me. So it's, um, a little bit of a complex thing because it is a really weird situation. And I, my rebound has been, like I said, kind of self-destructed, went into, I don't care. I don't have motivation for anything. Then it went into, I have to turn my pain into action. And so since the first one was in January, the second one was in June. And the second one was much further along. Like I carried through the full, I carried up till the second trimester. So it was just shocking. Um, and a much more like, it was a much longer recovery and whatnot. So I was like, 
I'm never going through that again. That was awful. And I think I, obviously I can't control that, but I wanted to take time. I thought, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take this pain and turn it into action. So I started all this testing. I swapped out all my products. I changed my diet and all those things I found out like we're good to do. I needed to do because I did have some things in like inflammation in my body and whatnot, but I kind of went into total action mode. And even my husband's like, I'm really proud of the efforts you're making, but I also feel like you're kind of under the illusion of control. Like if you just Mm -hmm. do these things, like that's why you were so upset when this didn't work out the first two times, because you're like, what the heck? I just did all these things and I've taken care of my body as well as I knew how up until this point. So why is this, you know, it feels like a failure. So I don't know if that is helpful, but that is definitely a scenario. And and let me just begin by saying, I'm really, really sorry. I think, I think that, um, <clears throat> miscarriages um, are maybe the most underrated um, source of grief. You know, it's almost like a lot of people feel like, well, you never met the baby. It's like, well, you know, and, and it's sort of like, let's not talk about it because you're going to get over that really fast. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, no, yeah. it's much more serious than that. I used to think that until this year. Yeah. I used to think like, well, it wasn't meant to be, or it wasn't really like a baby there, but The first one was, you know, I kind of describe it like this to people who are not used to this or never gone through it or who are where I was a year ago when I didn't think that this was really that big of a deal. The first time I happened, it was a little bit earlier and I was heartbroken and sad and just felt really confused. You feel like you're like, what, you know, and and you are grieving, but you're hopeful. You're like, okay, that's probably not going to happen again. When it happens again and you're further along, like it, it sent me into a tailspin of despair on top of. I saw arms, legs kicking, strong heartbeat. Like I saw what looked like a little baby too. So there's this whole element of like, how did death occur in my body, but mm. I'm still alive. That's a really weird, deep thing that no one really walks you through. Like what, it's a type of grief where there's physical pain and emotional pain that coincide in other, mm. and unlike some other things. And that doesn't make it harder or easier. It's just helping people understand. I try to walk them through that because it really does seem to strip away your femininity. It makes, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of complex emotions to it on top of the loss of a child or a child that you, you know, a future that you anticipated. So there's many elements to it. And I appreciate you validating that. Cause I think mm. It's natural if it's not something you've experienced and you never saw the evidence of that life. It's so easy to go, well, you'll get over that quickly and you can try again. You'll have another chance. I'm like, okay, right. but this isn't like batting. You know, this isn't like going up to bat and not striking out. This is a human life we're talking about here. Right. This is a family. So mm-hmm. yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. And it sounds like, by the way, that um, <clears throat> not to in any way sort of, okay, let's take an opportunity to talk about threes because of your miscarriage, right? But it sounds to me like your husband is really, really smart. Um, And and I bet he's not a three, right? I'm pretty sure he's a nine with a wing eight because he's definitely got some challenger in him too. But he's, I think, very much the like, he's very, he's the calm in the storm. I'm like, why aren't you crying? Why aren't you freaking out? Why aren't you trying to fix this? He's like, because we don't ultimately have control. I'm like, do something, you know? So we right. are very, uh, we balance each other that way and we drive each other crazy that way too. <laughs> sure. But he had a really good insight, right? Which is um, that you're trying to exercise control in a situation where you have none, mm-hmm. you know, where you're really powerless. And that would be hard for a three. And it's interesting what you said that, I, you know, I turned pain into action. Mm-hmm. Which is something threes are mm-hmm. and eights, but particularly threes are the most doing centered like yeah. type on the Enneagram. It's do, yeah. do, 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 right? Um, I I feel first. Mm-hmm. I don't do first. Mm-hmm. Your mom feels first, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And your instinct is to do first, mm-hmm. right? And and that can be a good thing, mm-hmm. right? Turning pain into action is can be a good thing, mm-hmm. unless bypasses the opportunity for growth, like, like being able to say, I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. Mm -hmm. And, oh, and by the way, I have to feel grief, Mm -hmm. which nobody likes, but would be particularly hard for a three. Yeah. Right. Um, Because you want to move on. Like, like your reflexes move on and it's Mm -hmm. like, but I can't, Mm -hmm. it's just, it just hurts too much. Yeah. Yeah. And um and there's in a way uh that's how the enneagram can help in real time. Hmm. Cuz it's like once I know myself I can sort of in a situation like that realize 
okay, because of my sort of interior architecture, the way I'm responding right now isn't healthy. Hmm. Th- yeah. Does that make sense? It's, yeah. it's understandable. Okay. Right. I'm not saying it's not understandable and I'm not saying it's bad. Right. I- I'm just saying uh, my normal default behaviors are not working in my best interest in this situation. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, yeah. and if you know what the default is, it's like all this kind of self-understanding and self-friendship and compassion and self-empathy mm-hmm. can really rise to the surface you know, and support you. So listen to your husband because he sounds like a really smart guy. He gave you really good advice that probably pissed you off. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, well, it's up and down, you know, it's like, I need that. And I acknowledge that I need that. But then there's other times where I'm like, yes, but I think this is where I struggle probably as a three and also as a, a bereaved mom. But I think in scenarios where it's like, whoa, this is so out of my control. And there's an element of pain and there's an element of fear of the future now because Um, you know, there's this weird in between where I often ask myself the question, okay, what's the line? Because I'm not going to sit here and go, if like I got tests done and I was able to find out two or three things that I do need to support and I should be make taking action to do things to optimize my next opportunity. Right. And so I look at it like, shouldn't I do the things that are within my control, which I think is healthy. But then I think what can become unhealthy is I begin to grasp for control as a whole. And so it's like, how do you do the things within your control without falling under the illusion that you're in control? Does that make sense? Like taking action on the things we can and then leaving the results up to like, it becomes this very complex thing because it's like, but if I do all the things I can, that in my brain merits, therefore it should work out. Right. So it's like, I don't know how to, even though I cognitively could have this conversation and say, no, that's not necessarily the case. My default is, it kind of subconsciously begins to lean into that. Like if I just check these boxes, I will have peace of mind knowing I did everything I can knowing myself, I will probably feel if something were to go wrong again, even more let down because I put in so much more effort. So it's like, what's the line? How do you navigate, whether it's this situation or something else, you know, it's how do you, I think that's the constant battle of, especially as a three, it's like, I want to take action on the things I can control without falling into that camp that's unhealthy if I'm in control because that's all, uh, you know, obviously we fall into that illusion, but it can get really slippery really fast. Yeah. And yeah. so that's something that I wrestle with often. Yeah. It's muddy territory. Um, that said, one of, you know, every number on the Enneagram, um, and I've never really gone into this teaching so much, but it's a big piece of the Enneagram, mm-hmm. which is all of us forget something as little people, mm-hmm. right? Or um, it's possible we disown it, but, but usually we just, there's some idea that we forget. And one of the ideas or the idea that threes tend to forget um, is that everything's going to get done. Mm. They feel like it's up to them to get everything done. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like, if I don't do it, it's never going to get done. You know, if I don't have control, if I don't take care of it, if I don't go into action, if I don't do it, um, and so what they have to develop is trust that it's all going to get done and it might not get done by me, you know, which, which is sort of having to let go of control. It's like taking a breath and going, yeah, it's going to get done. Uh, the universe is going to take care of this. You know what I mean? And I'll do my part, but I can't do the whole thing, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so that's, uh, I really appreciate you, you, you know, sort of sharing that perspective and I, all of us struggle with the illusion of control. Mm -hmm. All of us, I don't care what your type is, Mm -hmm. right? All of us do. But I think certain types probably wrestle with it more than others. I think ones wrestle with it more than others. I think threes do. I think uh, eights do. Uh, But, you know, in some ways, all of our types are a way of trying to be in control. Mm -hmm. Such a good point. We we try to control people with the suite of behaviors Mm -hmm. that go with our type. You know what I mean? In fact, we train people to respond to us Mm -hmm. and interact with us Mm -hmm. um, in a certain way based on our type, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I try to elicit certain things from people using the gifts of, well, the gifts or maybe the curses of my type Mm -hmm. uh, in ways oftentimes that are not good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like they actually are not serving me anymore. 
they, they may have worked for me as a kid to control the environment, right? Or to get what we needed. But later in life, you know, not so great, right? Not so great. Um, okay. So tell me about your book. Well, the book I felt like I wrote to myself. <laughs> um, so one thing I've noticed that comes with my personality type, which as we're talking about, this clearly fits into this three, um, is two things. One, I have a need to achieve, which can run me into the ground. And also I tend to have a hard time. Well, especially up until recently, I feel like I've grown through this a lot, but my natural state is I want to do everything all at the same time. And so I essentially wrote a book speaking into this because as I opened up about it more, even with different personality types, I think in our world, a lot of times, it's not that we have a lack of opportunities. It's that we have an endless list of options. And what I began to notice was a lot of people would reach out to me as I spoke on clarity I was getting or, you know, things that I was working on or how I was eliminating things to simplify my life or just different, different pieces. And this has become an even deeper adventure through loss and everything else. But as I was talking a lot about this concept of purpose and kind of being multi-passionate, multi-interested, um, I noticed there's a lot of books on shelves that are motivational and encouraging and write about like, you know, encouraging, especially young women, like go after your dreams, do the thing, whatever. And I remember I'd read those books and my, my motivational side and my achiever side would be like, yeah, let's do it. And then my other side of my brain would go, well, which one? Because we have so many different ideas. And um, I know that there's a lot of people out there who will hear, go after your dreams or step into your calling or however you want to say it and feel really discouraged. Cause they're like, I don't even know what that is. I either have no ideas or no clarity, or I have a million different options and ideas, or I'm just feeling pulled in a lot of directions or completely directionless. And so I kind of wrote it from that angle, this idea of one, as somebody, I wrote about my experiences of, you know, kind of the performer and and noticing that in myself and having a hard time opening up about hard things. Now I've gotten much more comfortable with that, but my default state is, you know, it's good, put it on, you know? So, and, and so I talked about this pressure to prove and how a lot of times we want to prove like I'm successful or I've got it together. I'm okay. You know, and I think every personality type I'm sure does it different ways, but the idea was overcome the pressure to prove and show up for what you're made to do. And the argument, the whole point that I try to make and own your every day is we've made purpose and our calling and our dream, like our purpose to be something we have to go find. Like we've, when we say, I need to find my purpose, we go out there, we're like, we're treating it this, like this thing. And I had this realization of maybe it's actually not something I need to find and grab hold of and do. Maybe it's already like hardwired into me. And there's just different pathways in which I can carry it out that will vary per season. So I kind of explore that concept in the book. And the idea is just, we all want to do big, amazing things with our lives, right? We all want our lives to count, but it really starts in showing up for the small everyday things before we can prove anything to anyone. And it was more written as a, I'm learning this alongside of you because this is my core challenge every day. And so, yeah, it was meant to be like a, take the pressure off and let's redefine this idea of purpose. So that's what Own Your Everyday is all about. Mm. Did you write this book after your miscarriages? No, but I have a follow up. <laughs> wow. I think a good three would have. I mean, yeah. it's it's you know uh, the reason I asked is you know when mm. we have trauma and we have resilience, mm-hmm. right? And some people have more resilience than others, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you threes tend to be very resilient, mm-hmm. okay, and adaptive. Mm-hmm. So. I would say when you have one of those moments in life where you hit a wall and you're like a pair of sneakers in the dryer, you know, just bouncing around and you just in a circle, right? It can bring a lot of clarity to what matters most Mm. in life. This is literally what my second book is about. It's like I started it with the first one and then I want 10%. (laughs) (laughs) So that's your next book. So yeah, that's kind of the concept of writing. It's all about redefining success. So this, you know, own your everyday was kind of exploring this idea of how do I figure out my purpose and what I'm supposed to do with my life. And it was kind of from this, per- it was this permission slip, like, Hey, take the pressure off. I've realized you're not going to figure it out overnight. It's kind of the, the foundational piece of that book. The second book is now being written after this experience. And the way I describe it is really, I felt like I just kept running into disappointment after disappointment, heartbreak and after heartbreak, no matter what I did. So it's this idea of like, how do we 
redefine success when our dreams just keep getting met with disappointment? Mm. And that's kind of the concept I'm exploring. And it really is. My, my last year has been a year of focus. It's a year of clarity. Um, we're not passion hopping anymore. We're getting really, you know, serious about a few things and doing them well. And, you know, for example, something we just did in our life was we sold our house because we lived on three acres. We had a lot of yard to maintain. We're trying to build our multiple businesses we run and we decided how can we simplify how can we make our life you know this isn't a priority anymore it sounded like a really fun idea two years ago it's not anymore it's a stressor so how do we eliminate stressors and so we sold our house and we built a simpler smaller you know home that we're about to move into so you know it's been a year of reevaluating priorities taking some massive action to really live aligned with those priorities and to focus on the few things we want to focus on so that's really kind of what i explore and unpack in this next book um especially for the for the achiever type and the high achiever that is, you know, learning to redefine what is success, what ultimately matters most because hardship can really bring clarity and disappointment can really bring clarity. Yeah. Wow. So uh, the name is of your book is Own Your Every Day, Overcome the Pressure to Prove and Show Up for What You Were Made to Do. It's a great title. And uh, I want everybody to go out and buy that book, Own Your Every Day, Overcome the Pressure to Prove and Show Up for What You Were Made to Do by Jordan Lee Dooley. We want to make sure that everybody knows about it and tell everyone where they can find out more about all the stuff you're doing. Well, you can come follow all of our fun adventures and craziness. Um, I'm on Instagram at Jordan Lee Dooley, as well as everywhere else on social media, the same Jordan Lee Dooley. Everyone says I have kind of like a Dr. Seuss name because it rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, we are so glad you came on. We'll have you on again when you get that next book out in the hopper and it hits the streets. And uh, listen, all the best to you and all the wonderful things you're doing in the world. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. I feel so understood now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> That's the point. And listen, Typology listeners, remember the words of the great Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Until next time.